Hello, my name is Andre Ward, and I'm the Associate Vice President for the David Rothenberg Center at the Fortune Society. And welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted by the criminal legal system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone affected by it. We ask you, the viewers, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and share comments with us on Twitter at the Fortune S hyphen O hyphen C period. Today, we're gonna to talk about something really interesting as we're looking to end the new year this year in 2020. We know that in January 1st of 2020, it marked the beginning of a brand new decade that many anticipated with optimism and a chance at a new lease in life. However, what followed in the following few months were a string of wildfires, airplane crashes in Iran and Pakistan, the death of basketball legend Kobe Bryant, social unrest in terms of the killing of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, the deadly explosions in Beirut, and various natural disasters all under the cloud of COVID-19 and the pandemic. In prisons, COVID-19 impacted many, and the number of people testing positive for the virus continues to grow. And this has prompted a real major push for the advocacy community to have people released early from prisons and jails, especially the elderly. Others from the advocacy community are advancing campaigns to reduce the number of people on probation and parole and pushing to ensure that people receive supportive services upon release, especially housing. Today, both sides of the bars looks at the year 2020 and decisions and really discusses where we are now and where the criminal legal reform world is heading. Our guest today is Gabriel Sayedge. Gabriel is the co-founder and the co-executive director of the Katal Center for Equity, Health and Justice. We're always excited to have Gabriel on and others. And the Katal Center for Equity, Health and Justice really works at the municipal level and state levels in Connecticut and in New York to build leadership and organizing capacity to end mass incarceration and the war on drugs. Gabriel said that thank you so much for joining us here today at both sides of the bars. How are you feeling today? I'm good, Andre. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you today. Thank you. Absolutely. And it's always a pleasure, Gabriel, to have you on the show and to be interviewed. Um, just possess a wealth of knowledge and just your commitment to advocacy and activism. Um, well, thank you. Obviously is, is recorded, right, and noted. And we thank you thank for you. joining us. And you and I know, Gabriel, that so much has happened in the year 2020. Yeah. Surprisingly so. And yeah. then in some instances, we just have been made aware of that, right? Just by virtue of people's pure grit and determination to get things changed. Yeah. And so we've seen like this, this wave of reforms that you've mentioned before across the country at the local and state levels. So I want to kind of get into that for our listening audience. Um, when we talk mm -hmm. about there's been a wave of reform efforts across the country at the local and state level, like what does that mean, Gabriel? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, this year has been really something else. I, when you were going through the introduction, I, the the fact that Kobe Bryant died this year, you know, it feels like years ago you sure. know, in a certain way. And yet uh, so much is, so much has happened. I think our experience of time is different in some ways because of this COVID crisis. Um, but this year has really been quite remarkable, uh, of course, in many ways, but on the, on the front for uh, criminal uh, justice reform, criminal legal reform, um, we may not have seen that at the at the federal level so much at the national level. Uh, obviously, between the pandemic uh, and then a uh, an election that was in its own right unprecedented in many respects, mm -hmm. um, the conversation around criminal justice reform issues around mass incarceration it happened in the presidential debates. That's good. You did see you know candidates talking about those issues. You even saw. Uh, 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 President Trump talking about those issues, sort of saying that he was more of a reform candidate than, than Biden was once that was down to the two of them. Um, and then you had certain things happen that were historic. You know, the um, uh, formerly incarcerated and convicted people's movement hosted uh, presidential candidates during the Democratic primary. 
um, at Eastern Penitentiary in Philadelphia, uh, that old prison there. And um, candidates came and talked to the issues that were raised by the formerly incarcerated and convicted peoples and family movement that had never happened before. So definitely at the national level things occurred, but really to see what happened and, the, and how extraordinary that really was, we have to look at the local level because there uh, at the state level and the municipal level, this year is historic. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a signal, I think, of just how far the movement uh, to end mass incarceration and the war on drugs has come. Um, and I think it suggests that we're we're approaching a time when uh, we're going to be entering a new phase of this movement um, because uh, uh, a, a lot of progress has been made and, and there's so much more to do. And I think some of the, the victories from this fall, uh, from the from the uh, particularly the election cycle, show um, that we may be able to reach even farther and uh, uh, push even further uh, for the reforms uh, and the and the systemic changes we know are necessary. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, Gabriel, when you talk about the state and local reforms that have happened um, and, you know, just tie that into the work that the Catal Center does around the war on drugs, what have we seen happen on the national scene as it relates to reforms and it relates to drugs? Because there have been some changes that's occurred in 2020, correct? Yeah, and most of them really significantly inside of the of the election, the this November election. So um, you saw, for instance, multiple states um, uh, with voter referenda vote to legalize uh, marijuana, um, and that included um, um, places like you know Arizona and Montana mm -hmm. um, uh, that also included in their provisions measures to um, uh, 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 clean the records of people who have been arrested on on cannabis charges previously, uh, which is which is really important. Um, but also South Dakota and Mississippi. Um, you know, and places that voted for Trump in, in really significant numbers are underscoring the fact that, um, at least with regards to uh, uh, marijuana legalization, it's a very bipartisan issue in that regard. Um, and more and more states have legalized uh, marijuana. And so the, the, that happened this um, election cycle, and that was voters doing that at the ballot box with voter initiatives. Um, one of the biggest drug policy reform measures that passed um, that's brand, the first one in the country to do so is in Oregon, they passed uh, a voter initiative to decriminalize the possession of all drugs. Mm -hmm. um, it's the first state to do this. Um, it's a really remarkable development here in the United States. Um, it brings Oregon in line um, with uh, countries around the world that have decriminalized at the national level, like Portugal in particular, mm -hmm. um, where the removal of criminal penalties for possession um, has led to a drop in um, uh, HIV infection rates and overdose fatalities. I mean, they've, they've generated quite a good, num uh, uh, many good benefits as a result of, of removing uh, criminal sanctions for possession of uh, all drugs. And they've seen uh, really remarkable results. And Oregon to do this uh, in the United States, which is, you know, the, the war on drugs has been, was born here and the United States has driven the war on drugs, both nationally and around the world for so long, is incredible. Um, and oh, that was done again through a voter referendum. So voters got to go to the poll and vote uh, on that initiative. Um, you know, in places like Connecticut and New York, where we don't have the voter uh, initiative option, um, if we want to do something like that, we'll have to go through the legislature and get a bill passed, which right. is going to be a little more complicated. But the fact that voters are, are making these choices is really significant and I think suggests that we're on the um, at the start of a, of a new phase of these fights. Sure, and I know that some things were happening in Los Angeles as well, uh, Gabriel. Talk to us a little bit of what, what's happening in, in Los Angeles relative to that. Yeah, I mean, then that's a, to go even more local, um, you know, counties, cities and counties across the country, um, you know, there were things on the ballot there, local officials, initiatives, and so forth. Um, uh, so a number of reform-minded prosecutors were elected in jurisdictions across the country. Uh, in Orlando, uh, in Chicago, um, and then in LA, um, you have George Gascon, who was just elected. And he's in the news today uh, because he just announced his new platform um, for his vision for the office of what he's going to do now. And he's really taking uh, 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 this reform uh, push here and running with it as he should, saying he's not going to charge youth as adults, he's not going to seek the death penalty. Uh, he is going to um, uh, pursue prosecutions of bad cops uh, in police brutality cases. Uh, he's going to do things his predecessor never did, 
um, and create policies for reform uh, for a reform orientation for that office that are uh, incredible. Um, and so, uh, and that's also, you know, voters in LA voted for him. They also voted to create an alternative uh, to a proposed jail uh, locally mm -hmm. in Los Angeles County. Um, and so at, at, when you look at the local level in cities across the country, you just see these really interesting and, and amazing changes happening uh, at the ballot box. Um, New Orleans just uh, voted for a reform-minded prosecutor. Um, and so these, these changes are happening in many different places around the country, not just in more liberal places either. As I mentioned, you know, even, even South Dakota and, and Mississippi, um, um, you know, where there's been a much more conservative orientation in many respects, um, you're seeing these changes being made. So uh, that wave, when you when you when you look below that national level, at the state level, at the city and county level, you're just seeing something happen here, which I think is the direct result of years of organizing and advocacy on the ground uh, by people all over the country, and um, and this movement that's been building that has gotten to a point that ending mass incarceration and ending the war on drugs is now a national topic not just in presidential elections, but it's actually um, a leading to really meaningful uh, reforms uh, at the local and state level. And uh, that's definitely the direction we need to be going in. Sure. And, you know, Gabriel, you've just given us like some perspective on a national level and what's happening. I'm just trying to bring it closer to home now here in New York State, in New York City. What are some of the things that you're seeing that's occurred, that's occurred in 2020 and what are possibilities, right? I think Again, what this pandemic has done in 2020 has ushered in a series of, of thoughts and ideas now that people are looking to be more innovative. People are looking to be obviously more um, intentional about uh, decarceration and ending war on drugs. So talk about like on the state level here, New York State, New York City, yeah. what, what are you seeing? What have you seen in 2020? Well, when we when we started this year, it was a um, a very contentious moment because in 2019, Katal um, uh, and many other groups worked to pass really comprehensive and far-reaching bail reform here in New York. Um, and once that was implemented, the jail population started to drop. Um, and uh, that was the, the, obviously the right direction, but it was not without controversy. And opponents of reform mobilized uh, last year in 2019, and they kept mobilizing. And so when we, when we came into this year, there was a big push to roll back and repeal those reforms to um, uh, the bail reforms here in New York. There was a big fight to try to prevent that repeal from happening. And they were able to roll back some provisions of the reforms, um, but groups came together and were able to defend uh, and protect the heart of those reforms and keep them intact. Mm -hmm. Then COVID hit. And um, uh, in the midst of all of that, and um, and it meant that many of the uh, campaigns that are working here in New York to pass really important pieces of legislation uh, to decarcerate and create a more equitable system, um, those campaigns went into the problem of COVID. Our legislature stopped meeting in person, and then they stopped holding their regular legislative right. session. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they went into these various sort of special sessions where they were only dealing with certain issues that were pre-selected, uh, and few of those um, uh, were about criminal justice reform, except uh, when it came to policing. Um, you know, in the wave of street protests that occurred here in New York and around the, around the country, I mean, the this summer saw uh, we saw the largest protests in American history. Um, in response to police violence against um, uh, black people and uh, in the systemic racism that's that's uh, evident inside of the criminal legal system uh, and policing practices, police brutality, the death of uh, Breonna Taylor, the death of George Floyd at the hands of police, people hit the streets. And there was a, uh, and you remember this, Andre, I mean, it was, it was really energetic. I mean, people yeah. in the summer were in the streets all over the state of New York that pressure really built. And the legislature did pass uh, really significant policing reforms that had been stalled for quite a long time. Um, police unions had opposed those reforms. Uh, DAs had opposed those reforms. Conservative legislators and even not so conservative legislators had opposed those reforms. But then this moment hit. And again, um, you saw people's movements driving the conversation. 
uh, enforcing action uh, as this national conversation was, was happening about systemic racism and police brutality. Um, a really remarkable uh, development in its own right, and something I've, I've not seen in my adult life. I think that uh, uh, sort of significant of a kind of almost an awakening in the country about some of these problems. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so legislature did pass uh, those policing reforms. That was really significant um, uh, and are gonna have a longstanding effect here in the state uh, as, they, as they move for implementation. But again, we ran into some challenges at the local level here in New York City. Um, there was an effort when the when New York City was was uh, putting together its next budget uh, for this year. Right. Uh, there was an effort to um, uh, take some of the money, the the extraordinary amounts of money that the police have here at NYPD. There was an effort to take a fraction of that funding and reinvest it in communities. And um, there was a, 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 a occupation at the city hall. Uh, people came and stayed there for weeks uh, to pressure the city council. Um, the city council eventually did move some funding, but nothing like what was being demanded. And I think it, what it demonstrated in some respects, um, while, while, the, while what happened was not as far reaching as, as what should have occurred and, and certainly was not consistent with what was being demanded. Mm -hmm. I think what it underscored is that we've made a lot of progress here in building momentum um, for uh, many of these changes. And we have to continue to build uh, momentum, continue to, to strengthen our movements, uh, and continue to work uh, uh, to build power so that we can push uh, uh, farther uh, ahead here and win these systemic changes and transformations that we, that we really need. Because uh, the, there's very entrenched forces here um, that are uh, opposing you know, any change to the status quo, and even is in the bail reform example, um, you know, even when we do pass something through the, the legislature, um, you know, those forces are waiting to try to roll things back and we have to be ready to defend and implement. And so um, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned out of this just here at the local level here in New York, but some tremendous organizing by folks um, around the state um, here in New York City and Rochester um, and elsewhere that uh, I think is really underscored and driven um, uh, uh, the movement uh, um, uh, for these broader changes. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Gabriel, because we know that the governor had repealed um, Civil Rights Law 50A. And, you know, I have my precious daughter here who's over here. And so, you know, sorry for the disruption. Um, but we know that the Civil Rights Law 50A, mommy has your iPad, sweetheart. Yeah, this is life in COVID now. This yeah, is how this it is goes. <laughs> Lena? Yeah. So we know that the governor had rolled back, obviously not rolled back, but had repealed Civil Rights Law 58, which had allowed law enforcement mm -hmm. to kind of hot protect themselves from the public accessing their disciplinary records, et cetera. What do you think, how, what do you, how do you think that, that kind of repeal now impacts like policing, um, et cetera. Uh, we know that's, again, that, that was a big deal, right? Because for mm -hmm. many, many years, law enforcement, and by extension to correctional officers, et cetera, um, were able to protect themselves by not allowing the public to access that. What do you think that means? Um, I was in a conversation uh, yesterday mm -hmm. with some funders and other organizations talking about um, police reform, right? And this is the some had lifted up the, the idea that this is the age old conversation where we keep talking about the same thing. Like, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Gabriel? Yeah, I mean, I, so the, the fight to repeal 50A, which was the, um, the, the secrecy law, uh, it, it, uh, that law dealt with uh, keeping uh, police disciplinary records uh, uh, out of uh, public view. Um, and the, the problem with that, of course, is that the police are public servants, they're paid for out of our tax dollars. Um, and yet uh, um, their disciplinary records here in New York were not available for scrutiny. Um, and that was extraordinarily problematic in many fronts, not the least of which is when uh, the number of people who have died at the hands of police here of NYPD um, uh, is from Eric Gardner on um, and many others. Uh, it's, it's, it's a serious problem. And when families and communities are demanding accountability, um, they're oftentimes not able to get it because they can't even get the information about the officers who were involved or who um, were responsible uh, uh, for killing people. 
-hmm. And uh, the group that led this, I, 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 I do want to lift up Communities United for Police Reform is sure. the coalition that led that effort um, and was really uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the entity responsible to getting that bill uh, over the finish line and, and, and getting it passed. Um, and I think one of the things that, that that bill will do, of course, is bring greater accountability, uh, uh, you know, to the police in, in New York City, which is just a, it could not be more urgent. Uh, you know, this is a, a, the largest police force in the country. Um, it's one of the largest in the world, 30, you know, 35, 40,000 people, um, uh, $8 billion budget, um, $7 yeah, billion dollar budget. 45 or so. Around yeah, I mean. Uh, it's they, like NYPD is uh, is the uh, uh, significant force in this city that shapes our, our lives. Uh, if in, in many ways that are um, extraordinarily problematic, not the least of which is the fact that so much money is going into NYPD uh, practices in ways that don't produce the safety that that all communities want and need. But I think the other thing that it, that that victory did um, is it showed that these extraordinarily powerful opponents can be beat. Um, it wasn't just NYPD who, and the police uh, officers union who opposed uh, those reforms, the mayor opposed those reforms and many other powerful forces opposed those reforms. The governor opposed them until he was for them. Um, and the fact that that switch happened is of course good, but that's what we want. Um, but it happened because coalitions like Communities United for Police Reform were absolutely relentless. Sure. And, um, and, and when the moment hit, um, you know, in this, in this powerful uh, uh, moment in the country, when people took to the streets uh, in the wake of the, of the um, killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, demanding justice, demanding uh, accountability, um, uh, and, and really forcing a conversation uh, that as a nation we tend to not want to have at all, um, as, a, as a country, which is about systemic racism and white supremacy. Um, sure. When that happened, um, CPR was able to uh, uh, leverage that into getting this bill passed. And the bill had been in Albany for some years. You know, this, the, the effort to pass it is, is, is not new. Uh, so it was not something that just popped out of, out of thin air and then got passed. I mean, people have been working on it for a long time, mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the moment hit. And, uh, and CPR, uh, to their great credit, uh, was able to get that thing over the finish line. And I think for me, one of the, one of the key takeaways there, in addition to the, to the good policy outcomes that that bill will um, uh, deliver in terms of accountability and transparency, um, and the range of other reforms that were passed that will, that will contribute along those lines as well, mm -hmm. I think it just underscores that, that even in the most challenging of fights, with the most uh, uh, you know, difficult of opponents uh, who are trying to maintain the status quo that is unjust, um, uh, that is racist, uh, we can win. If we, if we do our organizing right, if we, if we stay focused, um, work together, uh, um, victories can, can happen. And I think we're seeing that over and over again. And to me, that's one of the real inspiring things about uh, uh, this very difficult year. Sure. Um, you know, and, and a year of, of tremendous tragedy and, um, and surreal circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I feel deeply inspired by is that movements are growing around the country, mm -hmm. um, you know, from folks in local neighborhoods, you know, near and far building new mutual aid uh, projects to help people out um, and help their neighbors, especially in times of COVID, delivering people food who can't go outside and so forth. Um, to, to all the victories that we talked about earlier um, at the ballot box. This was a year that there was more voter par participation than ever, and especially young people, and particularly um, young people of color, um, uh, were, were the key to many of these um, uh, important races where uh, people were pushing for um, issues of justice and, and, um, and accountability. And so I think we were facing very serious problems and challenges Sure. right now from covid to the economy and 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 on and we've got a remarkable um, um number of, of social movements emerging in this time um locally around the country and mm -hmm. i i am deeply inspired by that and um and feel like that's one of the the real 
uh, uh, exciting aspects of going into the new year is to see what uh, where, where those movements go and, and what we can do together as 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 folks who are part of those movements. Absolutely, Gabriel. We're our time is almost up. Unfortunately, you know, I, we can talk all day, Gabriel. I'm sure, but you did obviously. Um, make some really good points, obviously, and then talking about COVID. We know there's an upsurge now in COVID-19 cases in New York State prisons, particularly Elmira and Cayuga. Um, we've seen 444 people who tested positive in Cayuga State Prison, um, 605 confirmed cases of COVID in Elmira, and a total of 1,776 cases um, total in the 52 prisons in New York State, which is a big deal. Then we see that there are um, at least 34 seats that are vacant now in city council coming up um, for 2021. The yep. mayor's seat is going to be vacant. The comptroller, public, uh, the public advocate. So there's a lot of things that's going to be happening in the next year that this year, in all its tragedy, um, creates this opportunity for us mm -hmm. to see some meaningful change. How can people get in contact with you, Gabriel, in the next 30 seconds, you and your organization? Yeah, uh, please, um, let our listeners know. Uh, they can go to katalcenter.org um, uh, and you can find us there. You can also find us on social media, Katal Center. And um, yeah, if people are interested, reach out. We work in Connecticut and New York. Um, and in both of those states are working on, on this issue of COVID-19 in prisons um, with our Freedom Now Connecticut and Freedom Now New York campaigns, as well as parole reform um, um, and, and, and efforts to close down correctional facilities. So uh, please reach out. We'd, we'd love to connect with folks. And thank you, Andre, for having me on the show and, and having Katal on here. We really appreciate what you do and, and the opportunity to, to join in these discussions. Thank you. Absolutely. And the Fortune Society thanks you, Gabriel and Katal Center for Equity, Health and Justice for the work you're doing on parole reform. We really appreciate that. The less is more work that you're doing. We've had some of your colleagues on before on the show. And, you know, we always thank you for joining us here at both sides of the bars. And we look forward to you joining us next month for another update around criminal legal reform issues. Have a good day and be well.